So instead of keeping your money in the bank, earning zero, what I'm doing, and this might be helpful to some of your listeners, are what are called commercial real estate income funds, because that's a way of getting an 8% yield super safely uh, over one year and annual. A rare situation is allowing you to buy some ETF stocks for 50% off. Learn more at crushthestreet.com slash profit 2017. Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I've been having a, a great pre-interview here with Jordan Goodman, a, a financial expert in every sense of the word. We've been talking about renting out uh, real estate and insurance and just kind of what's going on around the world. And I like to talk to people who've put the time in to really understand money and to get me to a destination I would like to be without actually having to go through the grueling pain of what other people have had to go through and make mistakes that I otherwise could have sidestepped by just listening to someone else. Jordan Goodman, his website is moneyanswers.com and he loves to answer your questions at that website there. He's a frequent guest on The View, Fox News Network, Fox Business News Network, CNN, CNBC, CBS. He's an editor, author, speaker, you name it. Jordan, without any further ado, thanks for coming on the show with me today. Great to be with you, Kenneth. Appreciate it. Well, the Fed has been attempting to raise rates, and they have been, into a struggling economy, many would say. And uh, also many would say that the system is too far gone. They're damned if they do and damned if they don't. But the problem is yields at banks are still very dismal. And so are the yields with government bonds. They're horrible. Correct. And Correct. It's you gonna stay that way, actually, yeah. <laughs> What's been interesting, the Federal Reserve has raised rates three times in the last six months. They did a quarter point in December, March, and June likely to do it at least one more time this year, maybe September, maybe December. Then they said they're going to raise rates three times more in 2018, and they're um, reducing their balance sheet dramatically. Remember, the Fed balance sheet in 2008 was about $700 billion. It went up to $4.5 trillion where it is now because they were flooding the system with money to bring down interest rates, stimulate the economy, and kind of save the economy from going off a cliff. Well, that was nice, but they didn't want to have a balance sheet this big. So they said they're going to reduce that by about $600 billion over the next year. The Fed's been the major buyer of bonds. Uh, they had the quantitative easing program where they were buying $80 billion of bonds a month for a long time. They've stopped that. So now they're trying to reverse that. So that could put upward pressure on interest rates as well if the major buyer of bonds isn't in the market anymore. Um, so uh, what they're, what people are getting charged for... Um, the prime rate, uh, credit cards, student loans, car loans, small business loans, all that is going up. So what people are paying is going up. But you're exactly right. What banks are paying on deposits is not going up. Mm -hmm. They're pretty much keeping near zero for CDs, savings accounts, money market funds, checking accounts are always going to be zero. Uh, and so what's happening is the bank's profit margins are widening, which is why the bank stocks have done so well this year. But the poor depositor is continuing to get zero and it's going to continue to for as far as the eye can see, frankly, because the banks feel people are like lumps. They just keep their money sitting there. There's no reason to pay them more because they'll just keep the money there anyway. So let's just have our profit margins and our stock go up. So great for the banks, but for depositors, it's, it's a real conundrum because they want to earn something on their money. They don't want to take much risk. Um, and sitting in the bank, you know you're going to get zero. Yeah. Well, you know, and at this point, I feel bad for most retirees because right. we haven't exactly seen hyperinflation with the dollar, obviously. I mean, a lot of people have been talking about that. You know, I've talked about the concern that I have with the dollar, the amount of money printing that we've seen. But yeah. the fact is, is the amount needed to retire has essentially a hyperinflated for people because of low interest rates. You can't live the same way you did off of 500 grand as you did, you know, say right. a few years well, ago. Unless you do something different. And that's right. And that's why I wanted to get into with you. So that's this is a big problem. And we have the baby boomer generation, you know, many thousands of people retiring every every day or whatever the number 10, is 10,000 10, a day 10, right 10, yeah 65 every day that's correct <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So what are these people to do? Let, let's talk about that. Okay. So instead of keeping your money in the bank, earning zero, what I'm doing, and this might be helpful to some of your listeners, are what are called commercial real estate income funds, because that's a way of getting an 8% yield super safely uh, over one year, an annual thing. The minimum hold is 18 months, uh, but you can get monthly checks electronically into your checking account first of the month right away. Uh, or if you like, you can reinvest it and have your money compound at 8%. Uh, there's a website for that, which is commercialrealestateincomefunds.com. Uh, they've also got a phone number, 888-444-2102. This is something you will never hear about from a bank. Okay, banks do not want you to know about this. And frankly, brokerage firms don't particularly want you to know about this either because there's no commissions involved. You give them $10,000, $10,000 invested. There's nothing, no loads taken off the top or anything like that. So what they're doing, Kenneth, with the money is they are lending it short term, meaning like a year or so, to people that are doing a wide kind of uh, commercial real estate projects. Things like apartment buildings, uh, maybe shopping centers, home health care facilities, uh, student housing. Uh, they need to fix these things up. And because of the Dodd-Frank bill, it's really hard for commercial real estate people to get loans these days, uh, either at all or in a timely way. So they're willing to pay a higher interest rate for a short period of time to get their projects done, which are gonna pay off big time because they're adding value to the real estate somehow. And what's also unusual about these is you not only get the 8%, but when the projects in the fund are sold, you, the fund shareholder, gets a piece of the profits that are sold as well. So that's another one or 2% profit sharing on top of that. Um, so there's a way the average person, minimum uh, investment, by the way, is $5,000. The, the average person can get 8% instead of keeping your money in the bank earning zero pretty much. Yeah, that is a that is a solid return on your money. And is this something similar to Rich Uncles? We have other companies out there, Peer Street, which are lending for, for real estate projects. Is And that, what it's cool similar, about- but the, different. The, the, those are more uh, flipping. Let, I, yeah, I yeah. Let me, let me just- Realty shares. Yeah, realty uh, shares. I, I, I know all about those. That's more kind of aggressive flipping. Uh, of, of real estate, buying it, fixing it up, selling it, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it can work, there's more risk in that. The, the concept behind these commercial real estate income funds is what they call forced appreciation. It, you're not depending on the real estate going up in value because you're in a hot real estate market. It's going up in value because you're adding value to it. Let me just give you an example of a recent deal they did, for example. There was a guy that had a very large house in a university town, I think it was in Boulder, Colorado. He was renting it out for many years to two students. He had two apartments in there. He got a loan from the fund, and over a year, he completely rejiggered this big house to make it into four apartments. So now a year later, he's got four rents instead of two from the same building. So you, having nothing to do with what's happening in Boulder real estate, the value of the property pretty much doubled because his cash flow doubled from the same property. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So going into it, they know in advance that their value is gonna be higher and their income is gonna be higher. And then he can sell the property at a higher uh, price and share some of that profit back with the fund. So that's the kind of typical thing they're doing. Before you even get started, you know the value of the property is gonna go up no matter what's happening in the local real estate market. Yeah, you know, that's really cool. And I, I wonder, what, what are your general thoughts of the, a lot of these companies coming about? Is this a, a solution of the free market and the internet and and more competition to the traditional banks that exactly. we have always exactly. we've always depended on. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think the the reason these funds they're, they're what are called Reg A plus funds, and what that means is uh, they're in effect kind of crowdsourcing. Uh, in 2012, the Congress passed what's called the Jobs Act, which allowed individuals to uh, invest in things that they in in the past would have been only for accredited investors and institutions and very wealthy kinds of people. I mean, here you can get into this kind of fund for only five thousand dollars. You know, before the Jobs Act, it would have been at least a hundred thousand, if not more, for accredited investors. So it, you're right, and and this is providing funding in this case to people wanting to do commercial real estate projects that they can't get funding from traditional banks. So it's helping both investors get returns they couldn't get otherwise and helping people get financing they couldn't get otherwise. So you're right, it's the free market kind of going around the block, which is the banks. The banks have trillions of dollars in cash and they're very reluctant to lend it out. They're just giving, and I mean, sometimes 
they'd like to, but the regulations, they've got all these, the control of the currency and everybody looking over their shoulders. Basically after the Dodd-Frank law came in, it said to banks, never take any risk on any human being for the rest of existence, basically is what they're telling them. You know, lend all you want to AT&T and Exxon, great. But your lo- local guy down the street, too risky. So the, you know, that, that created the marketplace for these kind of things where just because the banks turn you down doesn't mean you don't want to get your project done. So that's, you're, you're exactly right. It's kind of the marketplace responding to, as far as I'm concerned, over-regulation from uh, Washington. Jordan, uh, let's shift gears here and talk about people's savings. Uh, I read a relatively new survey that shows that the average American doesn't have $1,000 in their savings Correct. account. And I'd like to know in if, if this is a result of just a dismal economy combined with a, a low interest rate environment, which is discouraging this type of savings. And you know, wh- why are people not saving? Uh, they don't have the discipline to do it. I think your this, uh, survey was like 40% of Americans could not come up with a thousand dollars in an emergency if they had a, a car repair or something like that. That that is correct. They're living literally paycheck to paycheck. Um, now they haven't put money aside. In many cases, they've got a 401k being offered and they don't take them up. About 70% of the people offered 401ks at work sign up for it, being 30% do not. Uh, and you know, my basic principle of personal finance, Kenneth, is never refuse free money that's given to you. I hope you would agree with that one. And that's what a 401k can be. You're getting pre-tax money. In many cases, you're getting matched. And that's the free money, right? Heard. And that's the free money is the, the match. And again, 30% of the people being offered that are not taking them up on it. They say, I can't afford it. I say, you can't afford not to take free money. Um, and so that's kind of a, the way a lot of people save is through their, their work. But in addition to that, they should be setting up automatic savings vehicles where they take 50, 100, 200, whatever it may be, automatically out of their checking account. And you know, you're right, putting in a savings account where you earn zero is not a lot of incentive to make it grow at all. Mm. So you can certainly do it in an index mutual fund. I think there are ways of doing it through insurance uh, that are tax-free that could make a lot of sense. Or the thing I just mentioned, this commercial real estate income fund, if you're per- earning 8%, you're much more motivated to save than having it sit there like a lump earning you know 0.001 percent which is not not very motivating i must say Mm -hmm. Uh, and and we're now getting to the point exactly right people are turning 65 the baby boomers are what about 72 million people they are now reaching retirement in in a regular uh, way and the vast majority do not have close to enough to live a decent life and they're going to live a long time the fastest growing part of the u.s population is 90 plus because people are now living in the past they wouldn't have and that's going to be exploding in coming years through medical advances well that's nice but they don't have the money to last in many cases so you you know you're living 30 40 years in retirement during your working years you've got to be building up a lot to be able to have the capital to produce the income to live a decent lifestyle and most people are not doing it and they're depending on social security uh, last numbers i heard 40 percent of the people receiving social security retirement benefits it is their only source of income. They have not saved a dime. They're only living on Social Security. Social yeah. Security was designed as a supplement, not the main thing. <laughs> and it's the main thing for like 40% of the people. And also about 40% of the people start taking Social Security at age 62, which is the worst time to take it because you're going to get the least amount, but they haven't saved enough, so they've got to do that. Yeah. Uh, in, ideally, you'd wait till at least 66, which is full retirement age, or even better, wait till 70, where you get the highest benefit for a longer period of time. But the, I think only about 2% of the people wait until age 70 to start taking Social Security. So, I mean, this is just a sign of how little we have uh, saved in this country and how people are living hand to mouth. Yeah, you know, when it comes to the the future of people's retirement and how they're living longer, all these different things, I, I totally agree with you when it comes to the financial implosion of the system. But I guess what makes me a little optimistic is technology. I'm hoping yep. there's going to be some major technological advances that even the poorest people out there can enjoy a, a certain standard of living because things are rapidly improving. I mean, who knows what's going to be around and. I mean, even 10 or 20 big years, winners right? And losers. There are big winners and losers from technology. I mean, just you see what has been happening lately with Amazon uh, taking over the world, basically. Now they're going to take over Whole Foods, oh, which is going to be great if you're ordering on your Amazon Prime membership. You click a button, 
you have your food list already in there, it's just delivered to you. I mean, that's fantastic, you know, it's gonna be great, but it's gonna decimate uh, all the other grocery stores and all the jobs that go with that. So there's winners and losers in technology. I mean, consumers usually are the winners, uh, but it's, and you're seeing what Amazon's doing to traditional retailers, to Macy's and Kohl's and Absolutely. Target and Sears and all that kind of thing. So, you know, there's, it, it's, it's a, kind of a doggy dog work, I guess you might say. Um, what a strategic move though for Amazon. They, they went from just be having no physical locations essentially to instantly overnight having thousands of them with these this whole foods uh purchase or hundreds i'm not sure how many whole foods there are they've got about 430. there you go uh, see 400 so they'll, overnight they'll build more they'll build about they're gonna be a total of 1200 and i hear that on the roofs of all the whole foods they're gonna have fleets of drones which will be delivering people's groceries well I, and i guess the 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 point i was trying to make though not necessarily from an investment perspective but literally just from a quality of life if people are poor but technology is so advanced, it might very well be that these, even the poorest of the poor, enjoy a basic standard of living that is available just because of technology. What, what are your well, thoughts? I mean, you, you think of uh, people who are pretty poor still have mobile phones today. And I mean, 10 years ago, the Apple introduced the, the uh, iPhone. <laughs> it's only been 10 years. Yeah. And there's millions of them. And that has revolutionized all kinds of things including for people who are not all that well off. So yeah, well, giving people apps and the ability to pay things and download all kinds of stuff. I and mean, yes, uh, technology can be a wonderful thing. It's just very disruptive, that's all. Uh, sure. But that's the way the world goes on. That's the capitalist system. And you don't want to stop that. I mean, the losers like to stop disruption, <laughs> hmm. but uh, the winners, you know, usually consumers are benefit from it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think about, the, let's say, the poorest person in the world who might live in some isolated rural city who might not leave his 20 mile radius in his entire life. You know, years and years ago, you would have you wouldn't know what the world looked like. But today, yeah. uh, a simple video or a photo gives you the opportunity to experience what what China is like or what, what the Iwasu Falls in, in Argentina looks like and what a what an right, upgrade to right. someone's standard of living who otherwise is is flat broke um right. okay all right let's let's move on here so you talk about ways that people can can save I mean, you're talking about paying off a 30-year mortgage in five to seven years Correct. with your existing income level and that's Correct. a pretty hard thing because most people are in over their heads with their with their home expenses, whether that's rent or their, their, their mortgage, expense is their mortgage typically. That's correct. So this is what's called the mortgage equity optimization strategy, and just as what we talked about before with the commercial real estate income funds as a way of earning eight percent, you'll never hear about that from a bank. You'll never hear about this from a bank either, because the current system works very well for the banks. This is actually putting the power in your hands instead of in the bank's hands. So let me just briefly describe how this works. The traditional system is you'd get out a 30-year mortgage where the interest is pretty much all front-end loaded. The first 10 to 15 years in a 30-year mortgage, you're paying almost all interest, very, very small amount of principal. After 15 years, maybe you will pay off 10% of the principal of a mortgage because you're paying interest up front. And meanwhile, you're keeping your money in the checking account or savings account at the bank earning nothing. That's why the system works very well for the banks, right? Because they get your money for free and you pay them interest up front. And then even better for the banks is if you refinance your mortgage, if interest rates fall, then you start a new 30-year clock all over again, and all the interest you've been paying the last few years, you just threw away. That's why the current system is so delighted by banks. I don't want you to be part of that system. I want you to reverse the table. So when you do mortgage equity optimization, your money is working for you every day instead of the bank. So let me briefly describe how this thing works. You use what's called a HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit, which is a line of credit against your house, kind of as a second mortgage. You, it's completely liquid. You can put money in, you can take it out whenever you like with no penalties whatsoever, write checks on it, electronic deposits, you know, completely liquid. So you keep your income, which is normally sitting in the checking account earning nothing, you keep your income in the HELOC, okay? And when you put money into a HELOC, it lowers the amount you owe on it. HELOCs are based on what's called average daily balance. How much do you owe today? The amount of interest you pay 
is based on the amount of balance you owe, right? So um, you, you're putting your money in there, you're pushing down your balance every day, and then you pay your bills out of the HELOC. Um, ideally, combine all your bills onto one credit card. So basically you pay one bill a month. So every day during the month, you're making progress on your paying down your balance. One day a month, your balance goes up when you pay your bills. And then the rest of the month, you're making progress on your mortgage. So literally every month, your payment is going down because you're paying less interest on less principal until, depending on how the numbers work, five to seven years, your mortgage is completely paid off. Uh, there's a website that can kind of show you how this works in your specific case, free website called truthinequity.com. And you fill in what's called a personal profile where you put in your numbers, you put in your income, your expenses, your existing mortgage, your tax rate, and say, okay, based on what you're doing today, it's gonna take you 28 years to pay off your mortgage, and you're gonna pay $250,000 in interest, whatever the numbers come out to be. Based on the numbers you just gave us, your payoff will be 5.2 years, and you will have saved 150,000 interest, whatever the numbers come out to be, and then step by step, here's how they do it. Um, so that's a revolutionary system to put the financial system working for you instead of working for the banks. Th mm. Did that make sense? It absolutely does. And for someone like me, I, I'm all about savings. I mean, I, I was fortunate to pay off my home at, at a very young age and I, I, I paid it off and I, I don't have a, a mortgage on my existing primary residence. Now, I do have right. mortgages on rentals because I, I feel like that's and you may or may not disagree. I know Dave Ramsey but has an issue. This works the same way on rentals. This works just as well on rentals. You do a HELOC in the rental. In effect, what you're doing is you take the rental income and do the same system, and you can pay the rentals off just as fast, and now your rentals will be free and clear. Absolutely. No, I, I totally understand that. I, but I guess I'd have to go through the numbers and see what's better. Am I better off buying more rentals and, and leveraging up? Hopefully not getting in too far over my head. I know there's, there's a balance there or or just paying those off. But, you know, I guess what, I'm, uh, what I was trying to say is I, I – at a young age, I've always saw the value of saving. Now, I paid the price for it. I had a, a great parent, and I, I love my my parents to death. But, you know, in the middle of the summer, it'd be 85 degrees. We wouldn't be sleeping, and we wouldn't turn the air conditioning on. And <laughs> we would do a lot of things like that. And it yeah. instilled something in me to to save money. And I've always projected that assumption that other people would do the same way same thing and that's why when i read these statistics that most americans don't have savings in their account or they can't pay for a car basic car repair i'm blown away because i project the assumption of what i would do personally on other people and i'm blown away that that not many people think that way. No, not many people value savings. But they don't That's know what to do is what it comes down to. So, I mean, one of the people's biggest expenses is interest on their mortgage. And I've just shown you how you can save literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in needless interest by using the mortgage optimization strategy. People don't know about that. Mm. And the banks will never tell them about that. So that's one of the huge areas that they're wasting money that they could be using. So say your mortgage is paid off in five years, Instead of making a mortgage payment to the mortgage company, now make a mortgage payment to yourself in a uh, you know, commercial real estate income fund or a stock or something where it's growing for you. Your money is growing for you, creating what I call positive compounding, as opposed to where a lot of people, where they're negative compounding. They've got interest piling up against them, whether it be mortgages or credit cards or other kinds of interest piling up against them. Mm -hmm. What a difference in your life to be living in positive compounding as opposed to negative compounding. Oh, so absolutely. I've tried to help, so, so far in the, our discussion, I've helped you with a positive compounding, earning 8% of your money, and I've helped you with a not negative compounding, not paying tens of thousands of dollars of needless interest on the uh, your, using this home equity loan. There are three things you need, by the way, to make this work, uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. The first thing, you gotta have equity in your house. If you're underwater, there's nothing to borrow against, so you can't get a HELOC. Second thing, you need a decent credit score of, I would say, 680 or higher to be able to qualify for the HELOC, but most of your listeners would have that. And the third thing you need is positive cash flow. During the month, you are got to have more money coming in than going out, because that positive cash flow is what's pushing down that mortgage balance. So the more positive cash flow you've got, the faster the balance gets paid down. So if you're underwater in your house, you have a bad credit score and negative cash flow, 
this is not going to work for you, just so we're clear. But I think the majority of your listeners would have those three things. And literally, I've just saved them tens of thousands of dollars in needless interest. It's, it is powerful tools. All right. So a final topic that we want to discuss in this interview today, Jordan. Uh, let's talk about insurance, life insurance. Yeah. This is a big thing for people, whether to get it, not to get it, who needs it. The, what, it is a foundation for you know what we might talk about here. What is your general thoughts on life insurance? You need it if you have people depending on your income. Um, insurance is not for the benefit of the insured, it's for the benefit of the, the beneficiaries, the people who would receive the life insurance if you aren't around for whatever reason. The 3,000 people that died when the World Trade Center came down, you know, it was horrible for them, but they're dead. <laughs> the people that really got hurt in the long run were the people depending on the income that those people were expected to produce for the next 30 or 40 years. That's why you have widows and orphans funds, because they weren't expecting that, right? You never know what's going to happen. Terrorist course, incidents, course. Things, things can happen. So the, the reason you need life insurance is to protect the beneficiaries who would be depending on your income otherwise. So if you don't have dependent kids or you don't have a beneficiary who's not self-supporting, you don't need life insurance, really. But if you do, you really do. Now, it, in your younger years, you probably can't afford that much. So it's kind of a combination of term insurance and cash value insurance of some kind. Term insurance, you pay for it, you die, they pay, you don't die, they don't pay. And like 99% of term policies never pay off, but it's cheaper, so you can get more coverage that way. Cash value policies is where you're building up a savings element inside, um, and depending on how you do it, a whole life policy might pay like four or 5%, Variable policy is kind of based on how you invest it in stocks and bonds. My favorite is actually what's called index universal life, or what are called IUL policies, because the cash value there is based on the growth of the stock market to a certain cap, maybe about 12, 13% on the upside. But when the stock market goes down, you do not have losses on the downside. So in a 2008, when the S&P was down about 40%, you would have had a zero. You wouldn't have had any gain, but you would not have had any loss so all the gains from previous years would not have been lost. So that's what I like about it, is you have upside without the downside. Inside any uh, cash value policy, uh, the cash value is growing tax-free, not tax-deferred like an IRA, but tax-free. And then you can borrow it out in retirement, um, and uh, borrowing is, is also tax-free. And whatever you borrow is paid off by the death benefit. Uh, so in effect, you never have to pay it back. So say you had a million dollar index universal life policy, uh, and you'd borrowed out 400,000 in your, your you know, retirement years, when you die, the million dollars pays off the 400,000, and the remaining 600,000 goes to your wife and kids, whatever it may be. Um, and also you can use it, it during your lifetime, what's called lifetime benefits, for example, for home health care or nursing home or long-term care kind of benefits as well. So that's what I, and I've got one of these myself, an index universal life, and I put a certain amount into it every month, and it really grows very nicely. And I'm planning on using it as a uh, retirement income tool, taking loans out. If you actually withdraw the money, that's taxable. But if you take loans out, uh, it's not taxable. And again, it gets paid off at death. So that is my ideal way of, of getting life insurance. You need it to cover dependents, but it also can be a very efficient long-term tool to build money for retirement income. Right. And it's a good aspect for savings a safe savings vehicle because that's some sometimes that's what we need we need we right. s put a, our money into the stock market and if we buy in now who knows what happens next year and it, you know that's a little more speculative although historically the stocks go up um but in terms of just something that you can have a little more stability and we need some of that in terms of our portfolio diversification. So in the long run, the stock market does go up, you know, and absolutely right. You, but you have, in this case, you've got the downside protection. I mean, basically what the insurance companies do are buy put options. So they're paying a premium for that. And when the stock market plummets, like in 2008, the put options rise to offset the loss on the stocks. Most years, I mean, the last nine years, the stock market's been going up. So their put option premium, you know, goes away. That doesn't, but it, it's, it gives you that downside protection. So, I mean, if you're in a straight S&P 500 fund and say you're doing great in 2005 and 2006 and 2007, and then 2008 comes along and you lose 
of your money, you're, you're in a big hole you have to dig yourself out of to get back to even. With the index universal life, in a bad year like that, you don't go into a hole, you just have a zero. You see, so that's that's what I like about it, is that it gives you that, that. And, and I'm willing to give up some of the upside and cap my returns at 12 or 13% to have that downside protection. Well, uh, let's get let's get into some of the, the services that you know about for people who maybe shouldn't have life insurance policies. What are they to do? What you know, and Who's benefiting from these policies that shouldn't have been sold in the first place? So you're right, there's tons of people that have insurance policies they've been paying into for many years. They don't need them anymore. Say their kids are now self-sufficient. And so what, and they're still paying premiums. If they've got an annual renewable policy, the premiums can go up and up. As you get older, it gets more and more expensive. Uh, so they're paying all this money in and probably not getting much out of it. What they don't realize is they can sell those policies into what's called the life settlement market as opposed to letting the policies lapse. Same thing as we talked about before. The insurance companies will never tell you you can sell your policy. They're going to say, oh, you don't need any more, let it lapse, which means they've been getting premium dollars for you for 30 or 40 years, never had to pay out. They just keep the money you've been paying them. Instead, you can sell that policy, depending on the situation, for two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. You get the cash now, and the people buying the policy in what's called the life settlement market collect when you die. So say you had a million dollar policy, and say you're 70, something like that, um, and maybe if you have a heart condition or you know, some kind of health condition as well, somebody's gonna buy that policy from you, say for $300,000. You get $300,000 now you can invest. When you die, they become the beneficiary of the policy and they take over paying the premiums. They get the million dollars. They invested 300,000, they get a million. They don't know when it's gonna be, but they know at some point it's gonna happen. The insurance companies hate this kind of stuff because they love it to lapse, get them off the hook, um, but this is a perfectly legal way to do it. There is a website that can help people do that, which is called fundinglife.com, and they've got a phone number as well, 877-485-6681, and what they do is they put buyers and sellers together for life insurance policies in this life settlement market. So you would be the seller of a life insurance policy, you get whatever, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, they, the, the uh, buyer becomes the beneficiary and owner of the policy, they keep paying the premiums, and you got yourself a pile of cash you can now invest for income in retirement. Now frankly, the older you are, and the sicker you, you are, the more you're gonna get for your policy. Because the people buying the policy would rather that you not stick around too long, you know, five years, 10 years, they're not gonna buy it if you're 50 and healthy, okay? They're not mm. gonna wait 40 years to get their return. Um, so, you know, if you're a little bit older, if you've got some kind of a medical condition, this is one time when being sicker actually is to your benefit because you'll get more for your life insurance policy. Yeah, tough tough uh, subject to talk about and uh, to bring up to people, but it's something very important. And, you know, even if, even just like the life insurance was good for people, the legacy person, I mean, this is good too. I mean, this is good for the person who is actually needing to use the life insurance and get some value out of it, maybe to pay some medical bills. Uh, Jordan, or invest. I mean, we were saying people aren't saving enough. They've got money sitting in that drawer that they don't realize that policy. I'll just say, oh, it's costing me too much. Let me let the thing lapse. And the insurance agent says, great idea. You know, right. whereas there's this whole market of people angry, uh, you know, eagerly wanting to buy your policy for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars and get you off the hook. Yeah. So anyway, if that helps again, fundinglife.com, they can tell you all about how that works. Uh, so we've given you three strategies today that the insurance companies don't want you to know about, the banks don't want you to know about, <laughs> but they're for your interest. And that's why I like helping people, uh, giving them strategies they probably haven't heard about before. Jordan Goodman, everyone. Jordan, you've given us a lot of great information today. I appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for coming on CrushTheStreet.com today. Uh, I hope to have you on again in the near future. This was great. I'd love to answer emails from your listeners as well at MoneyAnswers.com. Thanks so much, sir. Appreciate it.